Let's jump to the story from the Daily Beast. Ukraine joining NATO guaranteed to start World War III, Russian official says. The war in Ukraine is guaranteed to escalate into World War III if Kiev is allowed to join NATO, according to a Russian Security Council official. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky made a surprise announcement that he had made a first fast track bid for membership. Blah, blah. We know a lot of this. All of NATO's 30 members would have to approve Ukraine's bid, making full membership of the defense group a long way off. Kiev is well aware that such a step would mean a guaranteed escalation to World War III. So, um, and here's a quote. Here's a quote. The suicidal nature of such a step is understood by NATO members themselves. Maybe one NATO country is just going to say, no, we do not want to vote yes on being dragged into a nuclear war. But the one thing I can say is that if you are between the ages of 17 and 24, because I don't think it'll happen right now, but you know, that, that, that draft age and you support this war, well, I'm, I'm, then I'm actually looking forward to you being drafted. You go fight the war that you supported. All of these Gen Zers with the little Ukrainian flags in their Twitter bios, I'm actually excited to see you guys go through basic training and then go be the cannon fodder for the wealthy elites who want to win this region of Eastern Europe. How about that? I would go even further. If you're a politician calling for war, go fight it. You're more than welcome to. You're more than welcome to join the, the armed you know, forces. What's stopping you? If, if you really want this, go go and get it. And I think that's how we should be treating these situations if we had an evolved humanity that said, you know what, we're not fighting these stupid wars. We're not going to die for politicians. We're not, we're not going to die for th these people that are selling arms and making a profit off of this nonsense. Um, we're not there. We're, we're at a phase where, of course, we have a lot of lunacy, we have a lot of insanity, and a lot of escalations to this conflict that are absolutely nonsensical. There's no purpose to us. There's no larger agenda here. What's the goal here? Why are we doing this? Can you even explain that? They can't. There's no rational argument for what's happening right now. Let me, let me ask you guys. Is there, uh, is there a circumstance where you agree with an offensive invasion? Is there a circumstance where you think the U.S. should declare war preemptively and then invade a country before being attacked? I mean, that's that's a very open-ended question. There could be many different scenarios. Sure, sure, sure. Many I'm, different I'm asking if you, if you can think of one. You probably can, right? Before being attacked? I don't know. So the U.S. sitting there minding its own business. There's another country that's minding its own business, but they may be engaging in some activities. Is there a circumstance where they don't attack you, but you think it is justified to invade that country? Well, if you're talking about a situation where you know they are going to attack you, that, that can be justified. But what we've done in Iraq... And what we've seen other, and what to some degree Russia has done in Ukraine is theoretically something is going to happen someday that will allow them to threaten us or attack us. And we need to attack them first before that happens. And that way lies madness. Well, that's what uh, Zelensky said. He called for preemptive strikes on Russia. He is also causing, calling for preemptive strikes. Yep. Well, then he walked it back. No, no I meant to. Um, preemptive uh, sanctions. Yeah, sanctions. Which there's preemptive. already a bunch of sanctions. Right. It wouldn't do anything to deter. In yeah. fact, it would just exacerbate the problem. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if there, if there ever really is, I'm sure a lot of the more libertarian types are probably like, no, there is no matter what some other country is doing, so long as they're not attacking you, you should not invade them. I think there are instances where a military buildup could be, uh, you know, cause for war. Like if, like Germany building up the tanks that it was building up before World War II, if, if France had been like, I, we, this is too risky to have that on our border because what happened was they blitzkrieged and they took Paris. Like within two weeks, it was theirs. And uh, that's what, if you let someone go full hog, mm. that's I why mean, they built the liberal economic order was to prevent other countries from going full hog. But imagine you have a neighbor and every day you say, you see your neighbor buying more and more guns. And uh, he's got a massive arsenal. You can see it through the window. Does that justify you going over there, having him arrested, his property confiscated, or saying that this guy's clearly going to be attacking someone? I better stop him. I don't see it. Now, but there is, there is an analogy. It's, it's, it, if you saw through your neighbor's window him br mercilessly beating a child, you would kick the door in and you would get physical with this man. Or you'd call the police. But if, if it was mercilessly being a child for the safety of that child, to stop this act, you would invade that house, right? That's also why that's usually the argument used for invasions. It's, it's, exactly. It's never just that, okay, they may threaten us, although th those arguments are usually used too. It's about whatever humanitarian bad things are going on in that country. And let's face it, in most of the world, a lot of bad things are going on. A 
a lot of governments are bad governments doing bad things. I'd say all of them. Yeah. And it, 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 <laughs> Every it, single it, one of it's them. It's not yeah, very much Thank a you. limiting principle. Preach. Sorry, go ahead. It's not very much of a limiting principle for war if you're going to justify it on that basis. Yeah. But, but then there's the next level of the United States and other governments staging these kind of events that are not true, that have no basis in reality, just like we saw in the first Gulf War with the baby incubator story, with literally a PR team working for the government, engineering a story that the Iraqi government was taking taking babies from incubators and just murdering them mur like, like, like they were just sociopaths. That story completely made up by a PR agency that led to the first Gulf War. There was public hearings, there was videos, all of them fake manipulated because again, they needed a justification. So they made one up. They had like a young so girl speak to the UN about yep. it. Isn't yes. That and right? she was uh, the daughter of an ambassador um, that, that again was coached and staged to lie on national television that she personally saw the babies taken out of the incubators, which was such a horrible, it's insane. You know, just, just visualization that it shocked people emotionally to say, yeah, we got to stop this. Yeah. Guy. Remember when they were, I think, uh, the Russians fired missiles into Ukraine like five or six days ago or something like that. I think they were missiles or bombs or whatever. And then I, oh, the, 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 the variety of airstrikes. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, all of a sudden this video of, uh, the United States invasion of Iraq shows up from 2003 what they call shock and awe. And the idea yeah. was we're going to hit them as hard as we can, as fast as we can, so that they don't even have a defense prepared. They can't, they just surrender. And it was televised. And I remember sitting in the bar in Chicago, watching it and like getting excited because I thought they had weapons of mass destruction. That's what I was told. And I was like, good, we're going to stop a tyrant from nuking the world. And I was excited. Like the way that you can, and, and, and that propaganda, man, the way that you can view bombing a city as a good thing or bombing it as a reason for war, like the crazy emotions that are involved with that. I think for me, I was probably lucky that I was, you know, through skateboarding, introduced to a lot of punk rock elements, anti-war elements. So as soon as this all started, the only thing I knew was here's why it's bad. So there was never like, I, I'm not going to pretend that when I was like, you know, 14, 15, 16, I was this political genius. No, I was just some dumb kid listening to punk rock being like, hey, war's bad. And then I got older and I started seeing the stories. I started learning the politics because that, that music got me interested in, in, more interested in politics. And then I was just outright like, yo, this is nuts what they're doing. And then Obama comes along and he's like, if you vote for me, we're gonna end the wars. And I was like, okay, I dig this. And this is like my first presidency. And all my friends are like, he's gonna do it, man. Bush was Hitler and we're gonna get Obama. He's changed. He's, you know, he's gonna be the first black president. And I was like, all right, you know, I'll vote for this guy. And then he right right when he gets in office, missile strike on a Pakistani village, killing women and children. And I was just like, <laughs> I was pissed. I was super pissed. I was like, my friends didn't care anymore. They're like, oh, I don't know what's going on. I'm, they stopped paying attention immediately because it was all a big propaganda machine. I don't think that there was an actual anti-war movement for the most part during the Bush era. I think it was a Democrat propaganda movement seeking to exploit the anti-war effort because they wanted to get a Democrat in office. If you look at a lot of anti-war marches, there's a lot of recruitment for other left-wing causes that have very little to do with wars. Um, yep. and, and, and it is, it's sort of a movement building exercise to a certain extent. Yeah. Man, that was, uh, that was uh, disheartening, mm. to say the least. Yeah, I thought there was, it, they made me believe that a savior was gonna save me. Like Obama was the savior is what I felt like. And I could actually take a back seat, but that's not, you know, you're the, you're the driver in this right Well, now. that's almost every president, especially in recent history. George W. Bush ran on a foreign policy of non-interventionalism. Humble foreign policy. A humble foreign policy yep. that doesn't get involved in other countries' affairs. That's what he promised. And then the dude just bombed a whole bunch of countries saying, screw it, I'm gonna do what I want. Give my buddy Dick Cheney, Halliburton, whatever he wants. And they lied. They lied through their teeth. Most wars are based on false pretenses. We could go all the way back from 1898 with the USS Maine. We could go to the Reichstag fire. We could go to the Gulf of Tonkin. We could talk about these events on and on and on. And the truth is there's probably these events happening right now that the american public doesn't even know about oh dude all the videos coming out out of ukraine yeah. and it's probably just and just one last thing probably vomitous. probably another event that they're preparing for right now that's going to lead to a bigger war so i i think that's a big possibility that i've been speaking about that every, we should be looking out for every single video on reddit or twitter it's always like, yeah, go Ukraine. And then it's like some Ukrainian soldier like flicking a cigarette and an explosion. There's another video where it's like a Russian and Ukrainian drone got into a sky fight. Ukrainians win. And I'm just like, dude, it is like it's propaganda. And that's why I'm annoyed by it. 
They intentionally want to filter out anything that could shift morale in this. I get it. But for me, it is the most annoying thing in the world when I'm sitting here going like, I know you are lying. Okay, this maybe works on other people. Fine. Leave me out of it. I can look up and see what's actually going on. I can make uh, assumptions and inferences based on the information received. But I'll tell you this, 100% of videos being showing Ukraine winning, and I'm just like, spare me. Okay, I'm tired of it. They, they used video game footage to promote the, the ghost of Kiev. Yep. I mean, how how dumb do you think we are? Well, like, the media ran with it. And these yeah. people, these people ran with it, and it was never corrected. There was never any kind of real, legitimate checks on that specific story. And again, I understand propaganda efforts during war are very, uh, you know, clearly used against the general public because they know information is key when it comes to winning the larger conflict here. But but at least try to put on a genuine effort and and not to treat people like utter idiots here. Well, the video gamification of war has been thirty years or more in the in the running, and and a lot of people in comfortable countries where they're unlikely to have to serve in any of these wars or fight in any of these wars do kind of look at it like they're watching a movie or playing a video game and you just are, get to see cool explosions. That's right. With this, uh, this invasion <clears throat> that Russia just propagated, they're, they basically annexed Crimea, which was old Soviet, I think. And then uh, yep. now they're trying to take the land bridge to Crimea. That's like what the war is about. It's not about killing people. It's not about genocide. But potentium, I, uh, potentially lithium uh, oxide, I think. In Crimea or in, in the, the Donbass region. Donbass. Well, there's, I mean, I've seen some reports about that. Well, there's a lot of untapped natural gas resources in those specific regions that the Russians are having uh, under control right now that are in contention with the Ukrainian army fighting them. I, I think it's the land bridge, though, because look, they blew up the Crimea bridge. Mm -hmm. How is Russia supposed to get access to Crimea without that bridge? They need another. Yeah, those two highways. Right. Yeah, they need the land bridge. So I think armistice is like the only way out is a some sort of peace agreement negotiation, but what would it be? What would be an effective negotiation? Do you cede a piece of land? How about we just have them sit at the table? There's people saying, you're crazy, you must be Putin, you must be a Putin supporter, you you must be a peacenik if you, if you, let's just have them sit at the table and talk to each other. At least let's get to that step. We're not even there. Zelensky passed the law saying, I'm not negotiating. Even re restated it, I'm not gonna be negotiating. Why? At least talk to each other. That's the first step. Because just we're footing the bill. Yeah. He must have some like nasty video of Joe Biden doing something, you know. I think it's funny because they kept people kept claiming that uh, Putin had compromise on Trump, and I'm like, yeah, but what was Trump doing for Russia? Like he bombed Syria, like you know, a half-assed bombing. Now you're looking at a hundred billion dollars or whatever going to Ukraine. Now that sounds like somebody's got dirt on you. Yeah, because the U.S. Why are we involved in this? Yeah. Well, Trump sent sent lethal weapons to Ukraine as well, which was a big escalation in this entire conflict. There was also a bigger conflict that could have unfolded with Iran that luckily didn't unfold. But 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 again, at, at, at the end of the day here, the fact that these people aren't even willing to negotiate is something that should be very troubling, because if you're not negotiating, if you're not just coming to the table, just to talk, let these people figure it out. I don't have the answers. Elon Musk came up with a proposition. It wasn't a perfect proposition for a peace deal, but at least the conversation was started. And I think the more people call for peace, the more likely we could actually have it, because right now all you're seeing is deranged lunatics saying war, 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 war with absolutely no goal in sight. And that to me is reckless. That to me is stupid. What What's the what's the strategic objective here? Why hasn't anyone well, told us this? Have you guys bought your burnt hair perfume to help Elon buy Twitter? No, not yet. I've I made bought that a joke so many times, and I think I should get a cut of this money. Mm -hmm. the, the, about him buying. Twitter. I mean, burnt burnt hair. I didn't know that he would have that be the same. Yeah. But I think Elon Musk. Your name is Musk. You Musk, have to have a cologne. Yeah, you have to have yeah, a perfume. You Elon's Musk. That's what he yeah. was saying oh, the other day. Please, yeah, I need it. Elon's I need it Musk. In my nose. <laughs> it's not the way it sounds, Elon. I need it. Um, yeah, I agree with you, Luke. We need some sort of diplomacy. It could be a simple video chat with Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin that's public. And yeah. they could, it'd be so easy. Well, the United States and NATO has to be a part of these negotiations since they're a part of this conflict. And uh, right. Vladimir Putin just made a statement a couple of days ago saying that he's willing to actually uh, be open to negotiations during the upcoming G20 meeting. Will the West respond with other negotiations? Will they be open to, to sitting down and talking to him? Because this is beyond just Zelensky and, and Putin. Zelensky should be there, obviously. Zelensky and the Ukrainian government should be sitting down with the Russian government and at least talking to each other in some kind Kind of capacity in some kind of way um and and those talks should at least be between those two countries what do they want let's let's figure out a way where they're both happy 
And it doesn't have to mean people are getting screwed over, people getting lied about. It doesn't mean you're a Putin agent that you just want conversations to happen. Yeah. I think there's a desire, though, to see a degradation of the Russian military, which they think is most likely to happen if this conflict continues. But the odd thing is that he called up 300,000 troops. So, like, if you want to see a... Conscripts. Yeah. So, if Conscripts. you want to see a weaker military, it's not by forcing them to draft 300,000 people. That's... Well, it also well, looks like... might not be the greatest fighters, though, to have. Yeah. From, from the latest bombings that have been happening in Ukraine, it does look like the Russians are trying to take out uh, the major uh, air defense systems inside of Ukraine. It looks like they're preparing for a major bombing campaign of Ukraine. There's also a ton of Russian soldiers being shipped into Belarus, and there's a lot of rumors that Belarus will also be participating and launch another front of this war from the north of Ukraine. So there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes that are very much escalating the situation that are very much unfortunate for all the innocent people caught in the middle of this because there's going to be a huge loss of life. I think we should be doing everything in our power to try to prevent that. And sadly, we have the opposite of that when it comes to the corporate media, when it comes to the leadership, when it comes to the Victoria Newland and all these other sociopathic neoconservatives that just want blood. And that's not what I want. I want the people of Ukraine, I want the people of Russia to, to come together and at least talk to each other. Thanks for checking out this segment from the Timcast IRL podcast. But if you want to check out the full show live, tune in Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And if you want more special access content, head over to Timcast.com and become a member. Your membership helps sustain this company, keep our journalists employed, makes this show happen, and you will get access to exclusive members-only segments of the Timcast IRL podcast. And there's a massive library to check out. So again, go to Timcast.com or tune in Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And we'll see you all there.